The title is that you may believe, that you may believe. That word believe is a word that we hear a lot, we talk about a lot in the Christian faith. That's a key word today, that you may believe. Now whether we like it or not, we're living in a world that's growing more and more skeptical of everything. It's hard to find people or sources or any messaging that's really unbiased or trustworthy. Even so-called science or data can give mixed results and the conclusions from that data seem to depend on the bias of the one interpreting the data, right? We can spin just about everything however we want to. It's not like the good old days, the good old days. You know, there was a time, you remember this? Some of our more seasoned brothers and sisters, do you remember the time when you actually had to take film from your camera and go to your local Ritz camera and, and put it in that envelope and make your order and you know, someone in a dark room somewhere that you'd have no idea where develops the pictures and you come back three days later and you pick them up. Remember those days? I mean, the good old days. At least back then we knew that those pictures were real, right? That that was real stuff. Because, you know, what happened over the course of time, Adobe comes out with this software called Photoshop and you can digitally edit a picture to, to, to basically be whatever you want it to be. And fast forward now to this, this time of AI. Now you don't even have to take the picture or, or, or anything yourself or the video even. It'll do it for you. And AI will, will generate this amazing painting, photograph, video, and it looks so real, right? It looks so believable. It's hard to, it's hard to know what to truly believe anymore. Like half the videos you share from your Twitter feed or your Instagram, the first thing, if it's a kind of a crazy video, the first thing that you say is, is that, is that even real? You know, that's just kind of the age that we're in. We're skeptical, skeptical, excuse me, about everything. So how do we know what to really believe? Well, I'm holding something in my hand that seems so ancient compared to today's modern technology. A lot of people will call this just uh, an ancient religious text. And I'm not offended by people calling the Bible ancient because it is ancient. And I think it's a compliment that through the last, say, 2,000 years, it has stood the test of time. It's been mocked, critiqued, dismissed more than any other book in history. And it has survived every attack that the greatest thinkers, philosophers, skeptics have thrown at it. And all the while, it's been the most published book of all time, the best-selling book of all time, and has been radically transforming lives this entire time and still does to this day. And to hit home a little bit on this, this book is why our church is still here today. There are many times where it seemed like maybe we would not survive, but we are still here. And I believe we're as strong as we've ever been not because of our great planning or strategy, it's because we have placed our hope and trust in the authority and power of this book. That's why we're here. One of the biggest reasons why we believe the Word of God is the truth is because it claims to be the truth. You're just being really nice right now because I know in your heads you're thinking, that's kind of a weak argument, Pastor. So you're saying the Bible is true because it claims to be true? 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Now track with me on this. This is why I say that. Think about the gospel writers like Apostle John and the context in which they were writing what they were about Jesus. They were living in a time of tremendous persecution for following Jesus. Pastor David mentioned that in his message in our early rice service this morning. All of the apostle, apostles were living in a time of tremendous persecution. In fact, all of them except for John were martyrs for their faith in Jesus. John was not martyred, but he was persecuted via exile to the island of Patmos toward the end of his life during the reign of Roman Emperor, Emperor Domitian. That stands to reason, right? In a context like that, any public claims that they would make about Jesus, they were risking their lives in doing that. And in making a written record affirming their faith in Jesus, they were risking their lives for that. Reminds me of uh, something my mentor shared with me, and I, I, I've shared this with our church before, but I'll say it again that my mentor said that, you know, in the Middle East, in much of the Middle East, in the areas that are under the control of Islam, to be a follower of Jesus is a death sentence to this day. In fact, to be a follower of Jesus means that your own family may come after you to take your life. That's the reality that people face. So there's no lukewarm Christians in the Middle East. They know what they're signing up for. Well, you know, the apostles, when they were writing down the words of Scripture, like Apostle John, he knew what he was signing up for. And when he saw Jesus on that cross and witnessed it with his own eyes, this is what he was so driven to say for everyone who would read his gospel. The man who saw it is given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. The man here is Apostle John himself. And he's saying loud and clear, I have been with Jesus for the last three years of my life. I saw everything he did. I heard everything he taught. I witnessed it all, and I saw him die on that cross. And I want every single one of you reading my gospel to know all of this is true. In fact, he doubled down. John declared it again a bit later in Chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John wrote everything he did in his gospel so that we may believe. And he did not have enough scrolls to write everything down. It's an amazing thought. Actually, John ends his gospel, the very last verse of the gospel of John. He, he says, if we were to have written down everything Jesus did in his life, the whole world would not have enough room for all of the books that would be written. That's an astounding thought. Wow. You know, does this sound like, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm biased here, and I admit that, but does this sound like a man who's lying? Does this sound to you like a man who's, who's knowingly deceiving everyone who's reading his words? I don't think so. This sounds like a man who saw something that absolutely transformed his life. What did he see? We're about to read the most incredible feat 
of all that Jesus did, all that John ever witnessed. This is the event of Jesus' ministry that John had to testify about, and not just John, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all had to testify about this, because this was the pinnacle of it all. This is the event that changed the course of human history. This is the event that made Jesus not just a good religious teacher or a great moral example. This is the event that validated that he was and is the Son of God, God incarnate. Everything in the Old Testament points toward it. Everything in the New Testament points back to it. It's the resurrection. The resurrection is the center of it all. There is no Bible without the resurrection. There is no Christian faith without the resurrection. There is no church without the resurrection. You and I will not be here in this room today. We're not Jesus rising again from the dead. The resurrection is the foundation that holds everything together and it is and always will be the hope of all mankind. And that's why we set aside this day to celebrate and affirm the wonder of the resurrection. Will you rise with me as we honor God's word and read our text here from John chapter 20. This is from the NIV 84, by the way. John chapter 20, here's what he wrote. Here's what he wrote about that special glorious day. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. Let's read this last line together. He saw and believed. Amen. Thank you. Let's be seated. So how do we know something's true? How do we know something is really believable? Well, one of the things that has stood the test of time as well is eyewitness testimony. It's hard to argue with someone who was actually there. They didn't watch a video or saw a picture. They were actually there and wrote about it. That's what John did. Now to clarify, Apostle John refers to himself in this passage as the other disciple. That's him, the other disciple, and the one Jesus loved. That's him too. And he's the one who could run faster than Simon Peter. That's him too. And it sounds like he's kind of full of himself, right? Yeah, the one Jesus loved. The one who always beat Peter every time they had a race. And he wanted to put it in scripture so everyone would know that he ran faster than Peter could. I have a feeling like they had races all the time, right? And, and, and John just wanted to maybe rub it in a little bit that he was faster. No, that, I'm just speculating. That's, that's not what scripture actually affirms. But uh, that's him. And I say this because actually he never refers to himself by name, does he? He always refers to himself in those other ways. And actually, I believe that's a sign of humility. It's actually a sign of humility. 
And when Jesus, or when John rather, said that he was the disciple Jesus loved, it's not because Jesus didn't love the others, right? It's like uh, 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 Emery when, you know, your, your dad says, I love you, right? He's not saying I love you because he doesn't love your brother, right? He loves you and he loves Edwin too, right? He loves you. It, it's, it's not because Jesus loved John more than the others. It was a familial term. It's because Apostle John actually had an intimate connection with Jesus-like family. That's why he wrote it that way. And you'll remember at the cross that Jesus, what? He dedicated his mother Mary to be under the care of who? John. Because he was like family. So I just want to make sure we understand, like, why does he call himself that? Okay? That's why. Now all this to say, for three years, John and the other disciples had left everything to follow this man named Jesus whose life and claims and miracles seem to point to him as the one true Messiah, a, a human being who was actually the son of God. They witnessed it all like we talked about. They received his incredible teachings. They knew he had an authority like none of the other religious teachers did. But then, on the day we just remembered as Good Friday, Jesus was scourged and whipped and beaten, spat upon, mocked, and executed in the most horrific way known to man, through a cross. The religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, the scribes, they, they seemed to have gotten what they wanted. They finally got their man. They finally got rid of this nuisance who was a threat to their entire religious system. It looked like evil was victorious. And the disciples were absolutely devastated. They didn't know what to do with themselves, so they went into hiding. They're probably grumbling and asking each other, well, what's going on? Did we just waste the last three years of our lives leaving everything behind to follow Jesus? And now he's dead? Friday passed, as did the Sabbath on Saturday. But then came Sunday morning, and everything was about to change. It was just before the crack of dawn, early Sunday morning, that a group of devoted women, led by Mary Magdalene, were on their way to visit the tomb. And they brought their spices and, and, and their perfumes, as was the custom to embalm a dead body, to honor that body. It was a beautiful act of devotion and love for Jesus. But it also shows they expected to see Jesus' body in the tomb, still dead. They did not expect that the stone would be removed and that he would not be in there. By the way, did Jesus move the stone? Did Jesus move the stone? Little Bible trivia, we've been talking about the resurrection how many years? Who moved the stone? How many of you say it was Jesus? The way I set it up, I can tell how many hands are gonna go up, right? Yeah, it wasn't Jesus. Jesus didn't remove the stone. Scripture says the angel who appeared later removed the stone. That means the stone was still there when Jesus walked out. Whoa, that's crazy, right? In his glorified body, Jesus walked through the stone. And not only did he walk through the stone, but he also walked through the doors where the disciples were hiding when he revealed himself to them. He didn't knock, he didn't crawl through the window, he just appeared. And it's an amazing reality, actually, to think about it. Because the body of Jesus, after his resurrection, his glorified body could be touched. It could be seen. He could eat. Remember he had breakfast with the disciples on the beach? He could eat, and yet he could walk through walls. That's an amazing thing. Now, our glorified body, this is a bonus here. This is kind of a, 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 a tangent. But what a promise it is that we will have glorified bodies for all eternity in heaven. That's an amazing reality. Wow. 
But we can talk about that more next time. They arrived and they were stunned. So Mary Magdalene, in her shock, went. She went back, the women went back to report this to the disciples because they knew where the disciples were hiding and said, his body's not there. The tomb is empty. And the disciples, specifically Simon Peter and John, they were like, what? And they took off running from where they were hiding to go to the tomb. And as we were, we just read, John got there first because he was a faster runner than Simon Peter. But once he got there and saw what was the fact that the tomb was empty, he, he was stopped, he just stopped in his tracks. He, he couldn't move anymore. He was shocked. Now, Simon Peter was the slower one, but we know what he was like, right? Simon Peter was a bull in a china shop. Once he got there, he didn't stop. He ran right in. So he lost the race, but you know, he was the courageous one. He ran right in and he saw the linen. The tomb was empty. A little bit later, John got the courage to go in. And when he went into that empty tomb, what did we all read together? Those words, he saw and believed. He saw and believed. That's a real key word. He believed. Believed in what? John already believed in Jesus. So what was he exactly believing? It, was, it must have been something he did not know or understand before. In that moment, something must have clicked for him. And in fact, it did. All the things Jesus had told the disciples about during his life, and, and specifically as he entered the last season of his earthly life, Jesus told them things like, you know, tear this temple down and in three days I will raise it up again. Jesus was telling them that he, he needed to suffer and die, but that he would rise again to life. But it just was veiled to them. But once John saw the empty tomb, mind you, he still had not seen the risen Lord yet. He had not seen Jesus' body yet. But once he saw that empty tomb, it says he believed. He understood. He knew. Jesus had risen again. And his life, well, at that point, you know what he really just, was his goal in his life? He wanted to write down everything that he witnessed, everything that now made sense to him, everything about the truth about Jesus, he needed to write it down because people need to know the truth. And as he wrote down his gospel, he wrote some of the most well-known words of all time. It's recorded in the third chapter of his gospel, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever would believe, believe in him, will not perish but have eternal life. It all comes down to what you and I believe. We can't underestimate how important it is that we believe and that we believe in the right things. You know, your belief about reality, about the world, about yourself, uh, about politics, about the economy, your beliefs are what drive everything about you. Does it not? Your beliefs are what drive everything you do. It, 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 it drives your opinions, your convictions, your decisions. What we believe is very, very central to our lives. But even more, what we believe is important because it determines our eternal destiny. You know, our physical bodies are obviously temporary, 
But scripture makes it so clear that our souls are eternal. We are eternal beings. And what separates us from a life of eternity in the condemnation of hell separated from God versus a life in paradise in the peace and the joy and the wonder of being one with Jesus forever in the new heavens and the new earth. The one thing that separates us from those two eternal fates are what we believe. What we believe. Specifically, what we believe about who Jesus is. So the truth is, a lot of people claim to believe in God. If you ask 10 random people today, wherever you might be, do you believe in God? I would venture to say the majority of them would say yes. They may not call him God, they may call him something, but they believe in, in God in some form. And, and some people would say, many people in fact would say they believe in Jesus. That they believe in Jesus. But what does that mean? That's the question that I want to challenge us to think deeper about today. What does it mean when you say you believe in Jesus? What do you mean by that? What kind of belief are you talking about? Because there's tons of people out there that would say they believe in Jesus. They believe that he was a great religious figure. They believe he was a great moral teacher, a great moral example. But at the end of the day, if Hinduism works for you, then follow Hinduism. If Buddhism works for you, follow Buddhism. If Islam works for you, follow Islam. So what is it that we mean when we say we believe? Jesus himself said, He's the only way to the Father, right? He said He is the way, the truth, and the life. Not a way or one of the truths. He said, I am the truth, the way, and the life. If Jesus Himself claims that, then either He's telling us the truth or He's lying. It's either one or the other. And He's telling us the truth then it's just logical then to come to the conclusion every other religion is false, right? If he is the truth. We, we can't say that we believe in Jesus as a great teacher, but we believe that all religions are equally valid. It just doesn't make sense when you compare the teachings of them. It, it's not coherent to say that. So how do we know that Jesus was speaking the truth? How do we know? Well, for John, he knew it. He knew it was true. With all his heart, with all his heart, he knew Jesus is the way when he saw the empty tomb. It all came together for him in that moment and he believed. And as a result of that, what he so desperately wanted was for everyone to, who reads his gospel to believe too. When he saw the empty tomb, he no longer believed that Jesus may be the coming Messiah. He realized with all his heart that Jesus is the Messiah. There was no shadow of doubt anymore. And if Jesus is the Messiah, then He is who He says He is. He is the way and the truth and the life. And it, that is true all of human existence. All of human existence finds its significance and purpose and destiny in the name of Jesus alone. God is inviting us today to go deeper in our belief. To no longer just believe things about Jesus, but to start believing in Jesus. Because this world, and I don't have to tell you this, we all know this, this world is growing more and more broken with every passing day. It seems that the darkness of human depravity is being magnified as the days go on. 
It is a dark world. So what is our hope in a world like ours? What is your anchor? What is your hope? And let me ask you this, is that hope powerful enough to overcome the world? So during a recent round of golf, I ended up with a quite an interesting pairing. One of the guys in my group, he was actually very scary looking. Two of the guys in my group were quite scary looking. I actually thought, I actually thought that they were a part of the Mafia. So here I am, um, playing golf with the Mafia. And I, I, I had no intention of talking to them. You know, I just, normally I don't, I just kind of do my own thing. But you know, golf talk, right? I think it was like the seventh hole. One of them, the guy who I was actually scared of the most, he, he asked me a question. He said, oh, what do you do for a living? You know, it's golf talk. So I told him, well, actually I do uh, several things, but uh, one of them is I serve at a church here in Granada Hills. And he perked up. Mafia man perked up. <laughs> and he was like, oh, that's, that's interesting. And I was surprised by his reaction. Well, it, it's because Turns out that Mafia Man is not the Mafia at all. Turns out he's actually a big time director in Hollywood. Wow, who would have thought? And no, we weren't at a fancy country club. Pastor cannot afford that. It was a local muni, 30 bucks for 18 holes. So it kind of blew my mind that this big time director was playing a muni, 30 bucks for 18 holes, but you know, that's neither here nor there. But we got to talking. And he started sharing with me about the next project he's working on, and that's why he prompted up. Because he's, he's working on a project about a priest who served the American soldiers in World War II. And this amazing story of how he served them so valiantly. And he's directing this, this, this movie. And it's quite a fascinating storyline. And then he went on to start sharing about his views on life. This is all the while we're playing. Right, so we, we, we had just hit our tee shot, and we're walking to the next shot, and he's telling me that, yeah, you know, I, I believe in a higher power. I believe there's some kind of a higher power out there. Call him God, call him Yahweh. And I said, oh, are, are you of Jewish descent, Jewish background? He said, he said yes, I am. I said, oh, okay. And he started sharing with me that because of this higher power he believes in, that he just, in his life, it's all about being good to people, treating people well, being good to others. And so we're having this conversation, but there's a problem. The problem is, we need to hit the next shot. <laughs> and I am confessing this so that all of you know that pastor is not as godly as I may seem at times. So we hit our next shot. And I'm like literally in this point of a fork in the road. Do I pick up the ball and just keep talking to him? Or do I hit my next shot because it was a really good drive? And I had only like a hundred yards in on a long par four. And I was like, ah! So I hit the shot. <laughs> and made par. And all the while thinking, I should have picked up the ball and just kept talking to him. But anyway, that conversation stayed with me since that day. And I thought about it more and more, and it started to stir my heart. Now because, it, it, it stirred my heart because I couldn't help but to think, people like him have all sorts of mantras in life, right? Be kind, be nice to others, serve other people. And all of these mantras are good things. No one's gonna argue with being good to people. We should serve others and be good to people, of course. But what stirred my heart is the reality that when I think about those kinds of mantras in life, I, it stirs me. 
So I'm like, that's not good enough for a world like ours. It's not powerful enough for a world like ours. There's too much at stake in a world like ours, where there is so much depravity and brokenness everywhere. To just simply live, to just want to be good to others, is not good enough. This world is too scary. There's too much at stake to be able to find the answer in life in our own goodness or ability. We need something far greater than our good deeds. We need something that tackles the issue of man's depravity head on. We need something that goes beyond human capability. We need something that gives us hope that overcomes the world. Is your belief system in life or your belief in God powerful enough to overcome the world? Is it? Is your belief powerful enough to anchor you when you walk through the darkest night and the most tragic storms? Do you have an anchor of belief in Jesus in your life that will keep your feet firm in the storm? John himself declared in a later epistle that, that he wrote, 1 John 5, verse 5, Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah, that's the kind of hope and belief that the Bible is talking about. That is possible for you and I. It's a belief, a faith, a hope that actually overcomes the world. Where does that come from? Believing that Jesus is the Son of God. If you believe in Jesus as the risen Savior, as the Son of God, Scripture says you and I overcome the world. That's not just some nice Christian speak. That's truth. You and I overcome the world. Sin has infected every part of life. It separated us from God and sentenced us to eternal hell apart from Him. But through faith in the atoning death of Jesus and believing in His glorious resurrection, we are given new life, lasting peace, eternal hope, unshakable joy. Jesus won the victory over sin. He overcame everything this world and this life can throw at us. He overcame it all so we can overcome it too. Cancer. overcome by the hope that we will have a glorified body for eternity in heaven. Death overcome by the promise, by the promise that when our earthly heartbeat comes to an end, immediately our heavenly heartbeat will begin and it will be glorious. Loneliness overcome by the amazing reality that God is with me and will never leave me or forsake me. And He has made me part of His kingdom family. Depression overcome by the reality that as the great old song says, life is worth living because Jesus lives. You don't need, you don't need to end your journey on your own. Life is worth living because God has a purpose for you. Fear overcome 
by a peace that surpasses all understanding. Sickness, sorrow, war, all of the things we could go on and on and on about everything this world could throw at us. And Jesus says, I have overcome all of it. It was a promise he made to the disciples and John wrote this down too. And what a powerful truth this is to bring all of life into perspective. Jesus is speaking to the disciples and says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The thing is, we, we often forget this. And, and when trouble comes, we, we're tempted to doubt God, aren't we? When trouble comes, when that diagnosis comes, when, when the fear starts to rise up, when, when, no matter what it is, when the trouble comes, we start to question whether God is real. We start to question whether He is good. We question His wisdom. We question all sorts of things. But notice what Jesus said. What did He promise and what did He not promise? He did not promise a life where we will have no trouble. He knew we are living in a world that is marred by sin. He said, you will have challenges. There will be tribulation. There will be trouble. But what does he promise? Peace. Peace in the storm. Peace in whatever that trial may be. He promises that he has overcome all of it. So we can take heart. Jesus overcame the world. He defeated even death, the last enemy. And through his resurrection on the third day, he overcame it all. And in his victory, our salvation was won. He overcame, and in him, we can overcome too. The only question, and let me close with this, is do you truly believe in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? I'm not talking about believing things about Jesus or believing Jesus from an arm's length. I'm talking about do you believe in Him as the risen Lord and Savior of your life? So that if someone were to ask you, you really believe in this heaven nonsense? You really believe in, 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 in the things that the Bible talks about? Are you kidding me? You actually believe that? You rise up in that moment with all the conviction in your heart and say, Yes, I believe with all my heart. And I know where I'm going. You need an anchor like that in your life. Anything else, it falls short. It's just not good enough. Having a nice life and making a nice salary, it's, just, it's not good enough. Just going to church and going through the religious motions, it's not good enough. Do you believe in the risen Savior? The kind of belief that gives you real assurance of your eternal destiny. The kind of belief that can stand firm in the calm and in the storm. The kind of belief that knows we are sinners and there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. The only thing we can do is fully trust in what Jesus did for us. That kind of belief, that will anchor your life. John has given us every reason to believe. There's no such thing as blind faith, church. There's no need for blind faith. John wrote about Jesus, so we don't have to have blind faith. We can read about it all in the Gospels. He witnessed it, he saw it, and he wrote it down so that we may believe just as he did. What a gift that is. Have you confessed your sin and your empty way of living with this weak anchor of your life 
that you've decided to put everything upon and just live for this, even though there's no authority, nothing to it, other than what you just think is the right way to live? Have you repented of that? And are you at a place in your heart where something clicked today and you realize, I'm kidding myself, and I've been kidding myself for a long time. I say I believe, but I realize I really haven't. But there's something in you today that says I want to really believe. Maybe some of you do believe, but in your life, things have just gotten really hard. And there's been a lot of doubt and a lot of darkness. And today, as you come face to face with the truth of the resurrection, something in your heart is stirring. Something in your belief is reviving. No matter who you are, I want to invite you right now to pray with me. Will you bow?